him to hear his word again. May he open it up to us one more time and show us new things. We pray these things. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you are the great physician, the great surgeon, the great doctor, the one who changes us, who makes us new, and who makes us into who you want us to be. Help us to submit to that today, to participate in that today, to have hearts that are open today. And we pray that you would meet with us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. When my grandmother, Elizabeth McDonald, reached her 90s, her memory had faded quite a bit. You were never quite sure what year it was or who exactly you were when you talked with her for those last few years. You might be in Scotland with her in the 30s, running around with her friends. You might be in Southern California with her as kind of a new immigrant trying to scrape together life in L.A., land of sunshine and orange juice at the time. You might be in the Canadian countryside with her driving across country with, with Grandpa half a century before. He in his fedora and her in her scarf flapping in the rain. You never quite knew what time and place she was experiencing, but you got the impression that she was happy most of the time. Now I hope when, when I'm older and my memory fades, more than it has, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the moments that I get to experience over and over aren't the most thrilling or the most exhilarating, but the most intimate. I hope that I get to remember my friend Jason and I sitting in a room talking when there was a party in the next room, but just talking just to be there near each other. I hope I remember and relive sitting with friends after a morning of talking and coffee and everything else, just reading together silently. No need to say any words. I hope I remember road trips with my wife. Long road trips with my wife. No fedora, no scarves, but good coffees at our elbows and talking about everything from faith to family to art and to the kids we might have someday. I'm going to change this on here. These intimate moments when we were most ourselves, most unguarded. If we are very blessed, we will have a handful of these moments to relive, rare and beautiful and delicate like family heirlooms. If we cultivate a grateful spirit the way my grandma did, then we'll be blessed with a joyful heart even when the mind is unclear. We've been talking about the Papa prayer. This is our approach to relational prayer that puts our relationship with God first before any other kind of prayer thanksgiving or intercession or petition. It first addresses that most tragic question of the Bible, where are you? The Papa prayer, one method among many, is broken down like this. Present yourself to God. Tell Him what's going on in us, what's on our minds and our hearts at the time of prayer. Attend to how you're thinking of God, telling Him that He seems very close or very far away, being honest with Him. And then meditating on the images that he's given us of himself in scripture. Purge. Acknowledging and repenting of what is in between us and God. And what is in our way as we approach him. Approach. Approaching God as the first thing in our lives above any other relationship, above any other identity, above any other pursuit. We will talk about purging today. Taking off the armor that we hold up against others and God in our relationships. That's what brought to mind these intimate moments that I was describing earlier. To purge ourselves is to take off those obstacles that are in the way of our relationships with God and others. And to be the people God meant us to be in His presence and with others. To shed some of that armor that we use to protect the true self underneath. The times I remember most doing that in close conversations with friends, lying down next to my wife, on long trips with family, seem to come almost randomly and without warning. They are delicate moments. We can easily drop out of with a cynical joke or a flip through our phones. The armor that always falls back in place so easily. But what are those intimate moments with God? I think of a time when I was in seminary at a chapel service. Someone presented a poem during worship that expressed exactly what I was feeling in my relationship with God and life in general at that time. And I cried and cried like a baby. And I am not a crier by nature at all. Unless I like stub my toe really hard. Other than that, I've like cried at one movie my whole life. 
and definitely not a public crier, but there I was, just losing it. God knew it was on my heart and hit it in just the right way. Now, I could have gotten up and bought another cup of coffee. I'd done that many times. And I could have checked out and thought about all the papers I had to write or whatever, but I stayed there in that moment exposed to God's love. Purging, the second P of the Papa Prayer. And today we'll look at how purging looks in our relationships with the other, each other and the Lord. We'll look at a biblical example of what that looks like. And finally, some examples of me-centered versus God-centered prayer. Larry Crabb, in his book, The Papa Prayer, starts this discussion with a scriptural truth that is utterly important to have in mind. When we come to know Christ, in the center of your heart, in the exact center, the glory of God resides. The literal, real, overwhelming presence of God. And the point of the Christian life is to live out of that center. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And living out of that center ain't easy. It's an important shift of perspective for me. That God's music is always playing in here. Because the Holy Spirit is in here. And the point is to tune our ears to hear it. And get the wax out of our ears so we can hear it clearly. Intimacy, as I shared in my moments earlier and in my grandmother's life, isn't easy, easily to come to, and it isn't easily stayed in. Our default is to put up our guard between us and God, between us and each other. If the Spirit brings to mind a sin we've been involved in, our impulse is to justify it. Well, yeah, maybe I was mean when I cut that guy off in traffic, but I was in a real hurry to get to church on time. So... Or if the Spirit convicts us that we're being fake or smoke screening who we really are, we might start misdirecting. The Lord points something out and we say, you know, you're so awesome. You're so great. And we sing louder just so we can't hear that. Or we might be plunged into doubt and God brings up something in our lives that we need to do business with and we say, you know what, why do bad things happen to good people? And suddenly you're in a philosophical quandary. The standard trick of the used car salesman, when you hear the engine knocking on your test drive, was to do what? Listen to the bass on that radio. Turn it up. Oh, yeah. Those pistons are falling apart. Man, listen to that trouble come through. That is really, really, really nice. Now, if you're under 30, you may not know what a used car salesman is, because you do it all online, but you used to have to deal with it. Ask somebody older like me. This happens in our relationships, too. We hide ourselves from each other. Like Adam in the garden, ready to throw up a fight, or a joke, or a political statement, rather than to be our true selves with each other. If they saw the true me, would they like me? If they saw the true me, what would they say? If they saw the true me, would they leave? I was thinking about prayer as entering the house of a friend, especially one we haven't seen in a while. We embrace, we walk in, we get our drink at our elbow. And our friend says, how are you? And we know that this friend knows us well enough to know that he's going to get a good answer out of us, an honest answer. So we present ourselves to him, telling him how we are at the moment, what we're thinking and feeling. As we share a drink with our friend and sit at his table, as we walk out of the jarring, blurring nature of life and look at him, we remember who he is. He becomes clear to us. We remember that, again that he is infinite and powerful. As C.S. Lewis described Jesus, he is not safe but he is good. He is not safe, but he is good. We attend to how we're thinking of him and remember who he's revealed himself to be. As we do just that, we want to get closer to him and it becomes apparent what is in the way of that relationship. Maybe it's an outright sin we can feel in our hearts that maybe everyone else doesn't know about this or that, but he does and we need to get it out in the open. Maybe it's an attitude, we're living out of our own strength, or doing things, even church work, from the wrong motivation, and God is revealing that to us. Sometimes we're listening close enough to see that relational sin, those subtle but cancerous attitudes and habits that keep up that armor between us and God. Between us and who we really are is defined by Him. I want to look at scripture today that presents us with two different pictures of what it means to come before God. Luke 18, 9 through 14. And I've got a special reader today. Come on up, man.
also told his parable Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Look at you, man. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. He also told his parable to some who trusted in themselves that they are righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the, the other tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extraordinaries, unjust, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tis of all that I get. But the tax collector standing off for off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. Well, that's wrap. <laughs> Upstage right in the middle. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. There's a man who speaks from his heart right there. Now let me give you a little bit of set in here on this. The Pharisee has become a symbol of hypocrisy and negativity in our culture, but at that time, they were not thought of that way at all. Jesus is basically telling the story of something like a well-respected pastor who got up to pray. Pharisees were extremely serious about their faith and lived a very devout life. By the time this Pharisee was an adult, he would have memorized the first five books of Scripture, not five verses of Scripture. We're talking about five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So he would have memorized all of that. And that's a lot of pages, especially in Hebrew. And Jesus contrasts him with a tax collector. The tax collector collected money for the Roman Empire, extracting it from his own people. And to say they were hated is to put it lightly. They also made most of their living by skimming off the top, charging more than Rome asked for to get their little line in their pockets. A Pharisee and a tax collector wouldn't even have occupied the same sentence, let alone the same room. The Pharisee and the tax collector, the suburban pastor and the meth addict, the upstanding taxpayer and the adulterer with a hangover, the senator and the screw-up, the church elder and the drag queen. You get the idea. When we talk about purging ourselves of sin, asking for God's awareness to see what we have that needs to be taken care of, we can get past the obvious sins pretty quickly if we're paying attention. But it's fascinating how the Pharisee here gets stuck on them. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. He defines himself against the obvious sins of others. I am not this or that. I am not like other men, I'm different from everybody. And maybe that's the root of it. When we get fixated on how unique or special we are, how everything we do is just a little fresher, or a little bit its own style, then that should be a red flag to us. He goes on to mention the most obvious surface sins he can find, extortion, unjustness, adulterousness. God, I thank you that though I have my faults, at least I'm not a Muslim, an abortion doctor, a pornographer, or a gay person. Wait, let me turn this over. God, I thank you that though I have my faults, at least I'm not a Trump voter or a Christian fundamentalist. All right. <clears throat> All right. Sometimes you have to turn them over, see everything from both sides. All right, anyway, how's that for a start of prayer? He then goes on to talk about his own qualifications of righteousness. I fast twice, twice a week, I give tithes of all I get. He is thoroughly, thoroughly qualified here. He's not talking about giving a little bit for his faith and talking it up. Hey guys, look, I just gave a homeless person a quarter. He's not bragging about that. He's the real deal. The law in Leviticus said that the Pharisee had to fast once a year. He fasts twice a week. 
They said that he had to tithe from certain crops and goods that he had. He tithed from everything. And he would take out a pair of scissors and cut off the leaves from the spices in his garden and give 10% to the church. He was very serious and observant. I think the most telling phrase in this prayer, though, is when he says, I am not like this. I am not like this tax collector. I am not like this person right here in front of me. Us versus them. At least I'm not that guy. We come out guns blazing to say we aren't that person or that people group. And we're filled with righteous anger toward our target. That's when we need to be especially careful. That's when we need to be paying attention. Sometimes the most vocal, I'm not that guy, guys, are the guys with the most garbage that needs taken out. <clears throat> The issue with the Pharisee here is that he has no idea of the sin he's carrying around with him. His prayer very lightly addresses God and then goes back to who? Himself. Enough about me, let's talk about you. What do you think of me? He doesn't know himself at all. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes up to heaven. <clears throat> the posture here is interesting. The Pharisee standing alone, he's doing a public prayer right in the spotlight, which seems like his intention. The tax collector standing far off, he is standing in the shadows. He doesn't want to be seen. The traditional posture for praying in the Jewish temple was to pray with your arms out, your hand, your eyes up to heaven. And the tax collector would not look up to heaven at all. He beat his chest here, and the Greek says that he beat it and beat it and beat it and beat it and would not stop. He came from a merciless world. He had fallen between two stools culturally. The occupying Roman powers used him to do their dirty work and no more likely treated him like dirt. His own people saw him as a symbol of the enemy's power and a thief. His only comfort was money. And he saw the world as a dog-eat-dog, -dog, take what you can kind of place. But in this moment, he sees inside of himself. He sees what's there and what he needs. The Pharisee has used himself and others as a measure of righteousness and may have memorized a lot of scripture but forgot Leviticus 2, 20, 26. Be holy as I am holy. Be holy for I am holy. God is the standard of holiness. The tax collector feels this dark chasm between him and holiness. And all he can do, having lived in a merciless world, is to ask for mercy himself. He realizes he needs the strongest medicine that the cancer is in every part of him, and mercy is the only treatment that will bring it out. He has no bargaining with bargaining chip with God, he makes no case. He simply says, I can't do this, and I need you here. And this is where we get to the purging. First, we have presented ourselves to God, telling him where we are right now. We have come to him with good and the bad, and try to speak out of the center, for he is within us. Second, we have attended to how we are thinking of him, we have acknowledged that he may seem far away or uncaring or impotent to do anything in the universe or our lives. Instead of Adam hiding away and covering himself, we've come in like Moses to say, here I am, exposing ourselves by removing our sandals. And in this intimacy, in this holy of holies with God, his light exposes what needs to change, what needs to be removed. <coughs> G.K. Chesterton, the great defender of the Christian faith and a humorist of a century ago, wrote the mysteries of Father Brown, a Catholic priest and an amateur sleuth. And these have been made into fun little episodes by the BBC and other, you know, PBS. And have you ever watched Father Brown? I love Father Brown. He's, he's a lot of fun. My favorite story of Father Brown is a short story uh, written about the end of his career, where he's sitting across the fire from his arch enemy, Flambeau. And Flambeau was this terrible mobster and him and Father Brown chased each other throughout the decades, and that's the whole story to them. And Flambeau asked him how he, just a little country pastor of a very small parish out in nowhere, is able to solve these huge, heinous crimes. And Father Brown sips his wine in the firelight and says, that's simple, because I committed them all. I committed all of them. And to his surprised audience, he continues, you must understand, I am just as capable of any evil, any crime, any brokenness as anyone else in the world. Sin lives in me just as it lives in them. 
It is not difficult for me to get into a criminal's head because in front of God, we are all criminals. We are all in need of redemption. Purge yourself. Let God's gentle and unflinching light come down into you. Down into those most obvious sins and to those relationship sins that are further underneath. Down to those sins that no one seems to see, but that cause others suffering, that cause you suffering, that break down the relationships that God made us for. The temptation is always to see the tax collector in the corner. There will always be one. There will always be someone to say, at least I'm not that guy. At least I'm not that guy. Or we can talk about how the country's going to hell, and yada yada. Get the focus off ourselves. But I've heard it said many times, the quote is not original with me. I couldn't find who said it, but I love it. They don't need to be like us. We need to be like Jesus. Amen? Amen. They don't need to be like us. We need to be like Jesus. And that's what purging is about. Before you go into prayer to petition that your spouse start listening to you or your kids stop driving, stop driving you crazy, you take a look at yourself. Look at what you're doing to protect yourself or get for yourself in these relationships. Before you recommend that someone to God so he can do business with them, he may have something that he needs to do business with you about. There's a couple good examples from the book of a person abandoned to holiness. Not praying out of the self-protective hidden place, but praying before the great surgeon, naked before his holiness, and abandoned to God's protection. Now take a look at these. First he presents a scenario. A hurting wife. She says, God, I don't know what to do about my husband. I feel so unheard, so unnoticed. He rarely makes me feel cherished. I feel like I'm losing my identity. I hate myself. I have my, no sense of my worth as a woman. And then he goes on to give two examples of praying. And in the first, the woman isn't praying relationally. She isn't presenting or purging herself or abandoning herself to God's protection, but instead protecting herself in her prayer. Listen to the difference here. First, please God, either change me or show me how I can live with him, how I can find my voice when I'm with him. God, I need to know you'll be with me or feel your love and not feel so alone. Please help me learn to live with my husband without losing myself. A good prayer, a sincere prayer, and yet one that is self-protective and self-focused. Listen to the second example here. An example of praying is abandoned to holiness. First doing business with God before asking for things. Oh God, I'm seeing it. Nothing matters more to me than whether I feel good about myself. I relate to my husband without any thought of revealing your character to him. I don't even know what that would look like. I don't know you well enough to want to reveal you to my husband. Have mercy. That's a very different prayer. That's a very different prayer. That's a different prayer that puts your relationship with God and the business you need to do with him first, trusting that he will take care of you. You might follow this prayer with intercession for the heart of your spouse and for an improved relationship. But this prayer starts with the most important relationship, and that is between you and God. The third step for the Alcoholics Anonymous is not to try to please God or try to work harder. It is to, to surrender your life to God's care. To surrender your life to God's care. The care of God. Do you believe that He will take care of you? Are you abandoned to His holiness and His protection rather than your own? Another scenario. A distraught dad. God, my son has been using drugs for two years and I'm terrified that he will ruin his life. I've tried everything, tough love, counseling, backing off. I feel like such a failure as a father. Now first, a prayer by the person in this scenario who has not approached God relationally. He is not presented, attended, and purged, but is approaching from a me-first perspective. Please, God, show me what's wrong with my son so I'll know what to do. I'll do anything. It all seems so unfair. I know dads who spend almost no time and energy on their kids, and their kids are fine. I don't get it. I know that you have a good plan for my family, but please show me how to reach my son's heart. Now, there's a lot of good things here. He's praying to be a godly father, help his son to be like Christ. But look at the prayer of someone starting relationally with God first. Oh God, as I present myself to you, I'm beginning to see what's at stake for me. 
I'm terrified that I'll never be able to accept myself as a man until my son straightens out. And it's been all about me. I see it and it's wrong. As long as that terror drives me, I'm not loving anyone well. Not my son, not you. God, I've been living to enjoy my family, not to glorify you. And I've been obsessed with my dreams and demanding you fulfill them. Have mercy. A very different prayer. First, first thing, my son doesn't need to be like me. I need to be like Jesus. First thing. The person praying here sees that he is self-focused, where he's protecting himself rather than trusting God's protection. He sees where he's putting his family before God, which isn't fair to God or his family. What is the common refrain in these two prayer examples? Have mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord, for we have lived without mercy. Send your mercy through us to a world that is less merciful every day. Show us where we need to be more like you and set down our armor and accept your protection. So often God uses our relationships to expose these deepest of sins because it's in relationships where they lie. I have never been aware of my own selfishness and shortcomings than since I got very mad kids. I'd always been a pretty agreeable guy. In the past, usually patting myself on the back for my laid-backness. I always let the waiter get away with cold fries. And the person I had an appointment with, show up late or not show up at all, whatever. Or I let some demanding person take up all my time and energy and never put up a boundary. And sometimes I was pretty happy with myself, thanking God that I was not like other men. Argumentative, demanding, petty. But now I find myself with a family. If I don't plan out my time right, if I don't put up boundaries, I'm not the only one who pays for it. Now they They get a tired, stressed out dad, or they don't get a dad at all because he's off finishing his sermon. Or his paperwork or whatever. And I'm suddenly not the freewheeling, inconsequential Uncle Josh, but dad who has to sometimes dole out the justice and shut the door on other responsibilities to focus on my family. And it was a shock to me to find out that one of my greatest sins, what needed to be the most deeply purged, was my dependence on other people liking me. Shocker. Maybe not to anyone else, <laughs> uh, but definitely a shocker to me. I would always congratulated myself on my chill approach to people and the lack of conflict in my life. But I was surprised to find out that it was because I was protecting myself. What a shock to find out that all the stuff I was quote-unquote doing for other people was really about me. Being liked, being the center of attention, being the hero in the moment. Have mercy. Have mercy on me for my self-protection. Come and find me in this garden where I've hidden myself, Lord. Help me to stand up for the kingdom, for the truth, for my family, for my church even if sometimes it makes me the bad guy or the popular guy. Purge me, Lord, cleanse me so I can be closer to you. Those intimate moments, those moments that create the most warm and rich and valuable memories of your life, that time you went fishing with your dad, that time you took your daughter on a date, the very long road trip where you first told your, your spouse that you loved her. These are what life is about. And we want our prayers to be this kind of intimate, this kind of intense. The free will, free will gift that will cost you everything. Well, let's review for a moment. Purge. The third point of the Papa Prayer. We've taken time to present ourselves to God and tell Him where we are. We've taken time and attended to how we're thinking about God in the moment and prayed that that picture align with the picture He's given us in Scripture. Today we talk about purging, about doing business with God and letting Him show us what's in our, the way of our relationship with Him. The Pharisee and the tax collector. The church elder and the drag queen. The upstanding citizen and the homeless drug addict. Two examples of how to approach God and only one true answer. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I mean, they don't need to be like us. We need to be like Jesus. We looked at two examples of how we can pray from a self-centered place or from a God-centered place. We talked about how first we need to do our business with God before we suggest how He do His business with others. Amen. I said amen. Yeah. Amen. Right. Make sure it's on.
Stand naked before holiness. Abandon yourself to his care. He is a surgeon for sure, but his hand is steady and true. And he is not safe, but he is good. Let him do his work. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for being with us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for continuing to do surgery on us, even when we are unwilling patients. That you are always working on us to make us better, to bring us closer to yourself. Amen. Amen. All right, I will invite some singers up with me to sing the doxology for folks. You can do that. <laughs> <laughs>